In this video, we will delve into the events that took place in 2009 in West Virginia, a state in the United States. Stacy Smith, a 32-year-old mother of two, tragically became the focal point of this story. Shortly after Christmas, Stacy's father dialed 911, notifying the authorities that he had discovered his daughter lifeless. Upon arriving at the scene, the police stumbled upon a message on the bedroom wall, presumably left by the perpetrator. Let's take a moment to learn more about Stacy Ann Smith, who was born on September 21, 1977. Described as a stunning and sociable young woman by her family and friends, she was a cheerleader during her school years and captivated the attention of many. After graduating from high school, she crossed paths with Stephen, someone she genuinely loved and envisioned spending the rest of her life with. In June 2002, Stacy and Stephen welcomed their daughter, Mackenzie, into the world. Their joyous occasion led them to tie the knot shortly after. Filled with happiness, they believed their bliss would endure indefinitely. Four years later, their family expanded once again with the birth of their son, Landon. However, as time passed, Stacy and Stephen's relationship began to deteriorate, ultimately leading to their decision to separate. By 2009, Stacy's son, Landon, was three years old, and her daughter, Mackenzie, was seven. They resided in St. Albans, West Virginia. Following her separation from her husband, Stacy made every effort to ensure her children's happiness. One fortuitous day, while strolling down the street, Stacy unexpectedly encountered a man who had once harbored feelings for her during their high school years. His name was Brent, a person whom Stacy didn't hold much fondness for during their high school days. However, as time went by, their interactions gradually transformed into a romantic relationship. Stacy had officially divorced her husband, Stephen, and he was aware that she was moving forward with her personal life. When Stephen came to pick up the children for the weekend, he often witnessed Stacy and Brent spending time together. Brent established a harmonious connection with Stacy's children, much to her delight. However, as their relationship progressed, they encountered challenging moments. Disagreements and arguments became more frequent, often stemming from Brent's bouts of jealousy. He exhibited a desire to control certain aspects of Stacy's life, even going so far as to inquire about the identity of individuals she conversed with on the phone. Their relationship experienced multiple breakups, only to reunite once they had settled their differences. On the eve of Christmas in 2009, Stacy embarked on a fresh start by moving into a new home with her children. Her cousin, Timothy, and boyfriend, Brent, lent a helping hand in adorning the house with festive decorations, fostering a warm and inviting ambience. However, a few days later, specifically on December 28, 29, Stacy's father, John Paul, attempted to reach out to his daughter via phone, but received no response. Growing increasingly concerned after several hours of unanswered calls, John decided to investigate the matter further. He hopped into his car and set off towards the residence where Stacy and her children now resided. This new abode had only become their sanctuary a few days before Christmas, and John desired reassurance that everything was indeed well with his daughter and grandchildren. Upon arriving at the house, John found nothing out of the ordinary at first glance. He proceeded to knock on the front door and call out his daughter's name, but there was no response. The door remained locked. Peering through a window, he caught sight of three-year-old Landon inside and managed to capture his attention. As Landon approached, John inquired about his mother's whereabouts. To John's surprise, the young boy informed him that his mother was asleep. This revelation immediately raised concerns within John, as Stacy was not known to be a heavy sleeper and would typically awaken upon hearing knocks on the door. John requested Landon's assistance in gaining entry and provided instructions on how to unlock the door. Once inside, John instructed Landon to wait in the living room while he investigated the reason behind Stacy's unresponsiveness. As John entered the kitchen, he was met with a devastating sight, his daughter's lifeless body lying on the floor. It became painfully clear to him that Stacy had tragically passed away. The kitchen and Stacy's bedroom were both marked by pervasive bloodstains, hinting at a violent scene. In a state of shock, John immediately dialed 911, urgently requesting assistance. The police promptly arrived and conducted a thorough search of the house, ensuring that the perpetrator was not hiding within its confines. 
The evidence left no room for doubt Stacy's death was not accidental. She had succumbed to a fatal stab wound inflicted upon her neck. The detective's attention was immediately drawn to a message scrawled across one of the walls. The message, accusing Stacy of infidelity, consisted of just two words. The first word was cheating, while the second word commenced with the letter W. This cryptic message became a focal point for the investigators, striving to unravel the motive behind this heinous crime. The situation was heart-wrenching as Landon had spent the majority of the day alone, unaware of the tragic fate that had befallen his mother. Forensic analysis revealed the presence of the young boy's bloodied footprints on the floor near Stacy's lifeless body. This indicated that Landon had approached his mother, likely attempting to rouse her from what he perceived as slumber. At just three years old, he likely did not comprehend the gravity of the situation, unaware that his mother would never wake up. The police meticulously collected all potential pieces of evidence from the house, including cigarette butts and beer cans, in hopes of obtaining DNA samples that could aid in the investigation. However, the writing on the wall held particular significance for the detectives. It was imperative to identify the individual responsible for leaving that message. The prevailing belief was that jealousy served as the motive behind this tragic crime, prompting the investigators to delve deeper into uncovering the truth. The heinous nature of the crime suggested that revenge may have been a motivating factor. It was highly likely that the perpetrator was someone familiar to Stacy, someone she knew and trusted. The absence of signs of forced entry on the doors led investigators to believe that she willingly allowed the assailant into her home. Compounding the tragedy, Stacy's car and car keys were nowhere to be found, and her phone and the murder weapon were also conspicuously absent from the premises. In an effort to track down the culprit, the information regarding Stacy's missing car was promptly relayed to all patrolling officers, as it was plausible that the perpetrator had utilized it as a means of escape from the crime scene. The untimely death of Stacy posed an immense challenge for her loved ones, particularly her children, who now had to grapple with the heartbreaking reality that they would never see their mother again. In an attempt to gather any potential clues, psychologists engaged in conversations with Landon to ascertain if he had witnessed anything out of the ordinary that could aid in the investigation. It was possible that Landon had glimpsed the individual responsible for his mother's harm, but unfortunately he couldn't provide any assistance to the police as he hadn't witnessed the actual crime. Upon waking up, he discovered his mother lying on the floor and innocently assumed she was merely sleeping. In an attempt to rouse her, he approached her, but to his dismay, she remained unresponsive. The prime suspect in this tragic crime appeared to be someone who harbored a belief that Stacy had been unfaithful to them. During the initial stages of the investigation, two individuals emerged as potential suspects. Stacy's boyfriend, Brent, and her ex-husband, Stephen. It was conceivable that Stephen still carried feelings for Stacy, and despite their divorce, he may have been resentful that she had found another partner. In the case of Brent, his jealousy was a well-known fact among acquaintances. There existed a possibility that he harbored suspicions of Stacy's infidelity. In the process of unraveling such cases, investigators diligently explore all possible scenarios, even those that may initially seem far-fetched. Thus, they embarked on the task of discovering if there was a man in Stacy's life, unbeknownst to even her closest confidants. As a young and attractive individual working as a doctor's assistant, it was undeniable that Stacy garnered attention from the opposite sex. While patrol officers scoured the streets in search of Stacy's vehicle, investigators engaged in conversations with her family. Following these discussions, Stacy's boyfriend, Brent, emerged as the primary suspect. The revelation came as no surprise to her family and friends, who were well aware of Brent's overwhelming jealousy and tendency to lose control of his emotions whenever he suspected Stacy of interacting with someone other than himself. Brent's volatile temperament was well known, with his tendency to erupt in anger over even the most trivial matters leading to multiple instances where Stacy distanced herself from him. These factors combined made Brent an ideal candidate for suspicion. Consequently, the detectives resolved to locate him and engage him in a conversation, aiming to ascertain any potential involvement in the crime and establish his whereabouts during Stacy's demise. 
Their intention was also to gauge his reactions to these inquiries, seeking any noticeable signs of guilt or deception. Tracking down Brent proved to be a straightforward task, as he was discovered at his countryside residence. Prior to their arrival, the investigators obtained a search warrant, ensuring they could conduct a thorough investigation. Upon reaching the property, Brent was found in his garage. Although he displayed signs of nervousness upon spotting the police, it was important to remember that such reactions were not uncommon when individuals are confronted by law enforcement personnel. Investigators approached Brent and informed him that they possessed a search warrant for his residence, clarifying that their visit was directly connected to the ongoing investigation into Stacy Smith's untimely demise. The news of Stacy's passing struck Brent with shock, leaving him visibly overwhelmed by grief. However, the question lingered, was his display of sorrow genuine or merely an act? This prompted the investigators to bring Brent to the police station for further questioning, hoping to uncover the truth. Unfortunately, during the interrogation, Brent's statements only heightened the suspicions held against him. He disclosed that his relationship with Stacy had been characterized by instability, frequently marred by arguments and disagreements. According to him, their most recent quarrel had taken place on the day preceding her tragic death. Brent revealed to the investigators that Stacy had been unfaithful to him with one of his close friends. Despite the passage of time, this betrayal had profoundly shaken their relationship. According to Brent's account, on December 27th, following a heated argument, he decided to leave their shared residence. After some time to collect his thoughts, he returned to Stacy's house a few hours later, seeking a calm and private conversation. During their discussion, which took place in her bedroom, a sense of intimacy emerged between them. Eventually, at around 2 a.m., Brent departed from the premises. Stacy's son, Landon, and her cousin, Timothy, were present in the house during this time, both sound asleep. Brent stated that no issues persisted between him and Stacy when he left. Unbeknownst to him, it was not until the authorities informed him that Stacy had tragically lost her life. The confirmation of Brent's alibi remained elusive, leaving investigators with valid reasons to question the veracity of his account. To shed light on the situation, they proposed that Brent undergo a polygraph test, which would gauge his responses to critical inquiries. After some initial hesitation, Brent consented to the examination, driven by his desire to eliminate any suspicion surrounding him. Remarkably, he successfully passed the polygraph test without encountering any complications. Initially, the police contemplated removing Brent from the list of suspects, considering the favorable outcome of the polygraph test. However, during the course of the examination, sharp-eyed officers noticed a small crimson stain on Brent's shirt. Resembling a dried blood spot, Brent explained that he had sustained a minor injury the day prior, asserting that the mark was his own blood. Nevertheless, the ultimate confirmation or refutation of this statement necessitated an expert examination. In an attempt to authenticate Brent's testimony, the detectives made the decision to interview Stacy's cousin Timothy. As Brent claimed, Timothy was the last person known to have seen Stacy before her untimely demise. However, a significant obstacle presented itself. Timothy's whereabouts were unknown. Following the devastating news of Stacy's passing, the entire family congregated, yet Timothy was conspicuously absent. Efforts to reach him via telephone proved fruitless, intensifying concerns among both the family members and the police. The possibility that Timothy had fallen victim to a kidnapping loomed in their minds. Such apprehensions arose due to Timothy's prior struggles with illicit substances. It was plausible that he had incurred debts to individuals who sought retribution, but the situation had perhaps taken an unexpected turn. A new line of inquiry emerged, adding another layer to the ongoing investigation. As previously mentioned, Stacy's ex-husband, Stephen, emerged as one of the initial suspects in the case. It was conceivable that Stephen harbored resentment towards Stacy for entering into a relationship with Brent even before their official divorce. Although they no longer resided together, Stacy's actions may have provoked Stephen. The possibility arose that his anger may have driven him to commit the crime and leave a derogatory message on the wall. Furthermore, one of Stephen's potential motives could have been his children. As he only had visitation rights on weekends, it was plausible that he desired custody of the children. 
When Stephen was brought in for questioning at the police station, he displayed a calm and rational demeanor, further complicating the investigation. Stephen vehemently denied any involvement in Stacy's death, emphasizing that he would never harm the mother of his children. He insisted that despite their divorce, he and Stacy did not hold any animosity towards each other. Stephen's belief aligned with Stacy's family's belief that Brent was responsible for the crime. During the investigation, Stephen provided his alibi for the night of the incident, and the police were able to verify it, effectively removing him from the list of suspects. However, as the investigators continued their search for Stacy's car, they encountered yet another peculiar discovery. It was revealed that the car in question did not belong to Stacy, but rather to her boss, Dr. William Castro. This discovery raised the possibility of another man being involved in Stacy's life. During the investigation, it came to light that Stacy and Dr. Castro had a romantic relationship. Colleagues attested to their close bond, and it was even reported that he had given her a car as a gift. This revelation introduced Dr. Castro as a potential suspect in the case. It was speculated that he may have become aware of Stacy's relationship with Brent and decided to reclaim his gift. With this in mind, the detectives turned their attention towards Dr. Castro. However, he did not attempt to hide or alter his routine. Upon learning of Stacy's death and the investigator's interest in speaking with him, Dr. Castro willingly presented himself at the police station without any formal invitation. During the interrogation, Dr. Castro openly acknowledged the existence of an intimate relationship between him and Stacy. He confirmed that he was the one who gifted her the car and stated that their relationship had spanned several years prior to her untimely demise. According to Dr. Castro, their relationship was consensual and he had provided assistance to Stacy whenever she faced difficulties. Dr. Castro vehemently denied any involvement in the crime asserting that he had no motive to harm Stacy. He cooperated fully with the investigators and provided a detailed account of his whereabouts on the night of the incident. Importantly, Dr. Castro possessed a solid alibi that effectively cleared him of suspicion. As a result, the police now had one less suspect to consider in their ongoing investigation. But who was responsible for leaving the disturbing message in Stacy's home? What had she done to provoke such a reaction? Could there have been another person involved in her life? These were the questions that plagued the police, and they were determined to find the answers. Utilizing advanced GPS tracking technology, law enforcement successfully pinpointed the whereabouts of Stacy's car. Astonishingly, it had been abandoned in a desolate parking lot, approximately five miles away from her residence. Recognizing the immense significance of this vehicle, investigators swiftly dispatched patrol cars to secure the scene. The car was subsequently towed to the police parking lot, where experts meticulously examined it for any valuable insights. Although Stacy's credit cards and some personal belongings were found inside, no knife or other evidence directly linked to the crime was discovered. This only heightened the mystery surrounding the case, prompting the investigators to delve deeper into the enigma. Another unexpected twist arose during the investigation when the police delved into the background of Timothy, Stacy's missing cousin. To their surprise, they uncovered a troubled past marred by a criminal record and a desire to conceal certain aspects. Timothy had previously faced legal repercussions for both a sexual offense and theft. The allegation against him involved the molestation of a young girl. However, Timothy adamantly maintained that the girl had misled him about her age believing her to be of legal consent. Nonetheless, he had served time in prison as a result. Furthermore, he was legally obligated to register as a sex offender, a requirement he had failed to fulfill. Two days following Stacy's tragic demise, Timothy Ray Sutherland contacted the authorities, disclosing that he was staying at a nearby motel. According to Timothy, he vehemently denied any involvement in Stacy's tragic death. Due to his refusal to comply with the requirement of registering as a sex offender, a warrant for his arrest was issued by the court. However, when the authorities arrived at the motel where Timothy had been staying, he had already managed to elude capture. Nevertheless, there was a woman present in the room who was in a relationship with him. This woman disclosed that Timothy had sought refuge in an abandoned trailer located on the opposite side of the city. 
Acting swiftly, law enforcement apprehended Timothy on the same day, December 30, 29, and transported him to the local police station. During the subsequent interrogation, investigators sought to corroborate Brent's account that Timothy had indeed been residing in Stacy's home alongside her son. During the investigation, Timothy confirmed that he had been present at his cousin's residence on the fateful night. His cousin also asserted that it was Brent who had taken Stacy's life, emphasizing that Brent possessed a troubled character. The cousin further revealed that Stacy and Brent had a tumultuous relationship, marked by frequent arguments. On that particular day, Timothy witnessed a heated dispute between them, leaving him perplexed as to why Stacy remained involved with such a disrespectful and unloving individual. When asked about his decision to flee the crime scene and go into hiding, Timothy explained that he was driven by fear of being apprehended due to his failure to register as a sex offender. In essence, Timothy pointed the blame at Brent for Stacy's untimely demise. However, the credibility of these allegations diminished when the investigators received a report from the laboratory casting doubt on Timothy's claims. The investigation took a turn when the drop of dried blood found on Brent's shirt turned out to be his own, not Stacy's. The police were unable to gather any evidence linking Brent to the crime, leading to a further narrowing of the list of suspects. Brent maintained that only Stacy, Timothy, and three-year-old Landon were present in the house when he left. Considering Landon's age, it was unlikely that he could have been responsible for the crime or the offensive message left on the wall. This realization pointed towards Timothy hiding something. Investigators observed dried bloodstains on Timothy's jeans, prompting them to send all his clothes to the laboratory for examination. Despite Timothy's insistence that Brent was responsible for Stacy's death, the investigators persisted in pressuring him. Eventually, Timothy confessed and revealed the truth. Timothy expressed his frustration with Stacy's actions, believing she was making foolish choices by allowing Brent to yell at her and forgiving him repeatedly. On the night before her death, Timothy witnessed a heated argument between Stacy and Brent, which resulted in Brent leaving the house. However, a few hours later, Brent returned, much to Timothy's anger. Timothy was upset that Stacy had once again forgiven Brent and allowed him into her bedroom, fully aware of their intentions. After Brent departed again, Timothy went to Stacy's bedroom to have a conversation with her. The events that followed are described in court documents without unnecessary details. According to the documents in 29, Timothy Sutherland temporarily resided at the home of his cousin, Stacy Smith, in St. Albans, West Virginia. In the early hours of December 28, 2009, significant events unfolded involving Mr. Sutherland. During the argument in Ms. Smith's bedroom, an altercation ensued between Sutherland and Miss Smith. The disagreement centered around Sutherland's comment about Miss Smith's boyfriend's treatment of her. As the argument escalated, S Smith resorted to calling Sutherland a junkie, which deeply angered him. In response to being labeled a drug addict, Sutherland stormed out of the bedroom in a fit of rage. Seeking solace, Sutherland retreated to the kitchen where he smoked a cigarette to calm his emotions. However, within a short span of time, he returned to the bedroom clutching a butcher knife. Tragically, Sutherland fatally stabbed Miss Smith on the right side of her neck while she lay on the bed. Before making his escape from the scene of the crime, Sutherland seized a Miss Smith's cell phone, credit card, money, and car keys. In addition, he defaced a living room wall in the house by writing the word cheating. Timothy divulged to investigators that after he had inflicted harm upon Stacy, she managed to rise from the bed and take a few steps. At the time of the incident, her son was asleep in another room, and her daughter was spending the night with friends. Throughout his account to the detectives, Timothy displayed visible distress, shedding tears, and conveying a genuine sense of remorse. Furthermore, he provided the investigators with information regarding the whereabouts of the murder weapon. Timothy disclosed that he discarded the knife used to end Stacy's life by tossing it out of the car window, not far from her residence. Subsequently, the police located the knife in the exact location indicated by Timothy. Laboratory analysis confirmed the presence of Stacy's blood on his genes. Collectively, these pieces of evidence were sufficient to warrant charges against him. 
When questioned about the reason behind writing those words on the wall, Timothy revealed his intention to cast suspicion on Stacy's boyfriend as a potential perpetrator of the crime. Given the frequent quarrels between Stacy and Brent, Timothy aimed to create the impression that Brent, driven by jealousy, had taken her life. However, Brent believed there was more to the story. Brent suspected that Timothy harbored romantic feelings for Stacy and was envious of their relationship. On that fateful night, Timothy remained seated in an armchair in the living room, overhearing the events unfolding between Brent and Stacy in the bedroom. It is possible that Timothy's jealousy overwhelmed him, leading him to commit an irreversible act in a fit of anger. The police considered the hypothesis that Timothy may have unsuccessfully attempted to persuade Stacy to engage in a romantic encounter after Brent's departure from the house. However, no concrete evidence was found to support this theory. The events of that night remained known only to two individuals, one of whom was deceased. Although Timothy Sutherland confessed to his guilt during interrogation, he maintained his innocence during the initial court hearing in 2010. Nevertheless, the authorities possessed sufficient evidence to secure a conviction. The pivotal question revolved around which side the jury would believe, the prosecutor who argued that the crime was premeditated, or the defense attorney who contended that the act was committed in a state of passion. However, Timothy's actions of leaving Stacy's bedroom after their argument, going to the kitchen to smoke a cigarette, and subsequently returning with a knife indicated a level of awareness and intent. On March 18, 2011, Timothy Ray Sutherland was declared guilty. The court imposed a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In 2013, Timothy attempted to appeal the verdict, but his appeal was unsuccessful.